Hello, today is Thursday, August 10th. I'm Tony Mangino from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. These continue to be crazy times as reflected in changes we are seeing in the ICT world and with key providers. In the last few years, we've seen several reshufflings of the deck as providers spin off entities and services, acquire others, go into bankruptcy, and merge. If you contract with a provider, you need to take steps to make sure these market changes don't adversely impact your deals and the services you're purchasing. More importantly, you need to think about what you need to do now in anticipation of a change and what to do when your providers go through one of these mergers, acquisitions, or divestitures. To answer these and many other questions, I'm joined today by my colleague, Laura McDonald, a partner at LB3, who has dealt with this over the years and lived to share her survival tips. Laura, welcome. Tony, thanks. It's always great to be back on Staying Connected. So Laura, at first glance, it seems like key providers in the ICT space have been the same forever, but a cursory look at the news tells us that's not so. What have you seen? Uh, Well, Tony, perhaps that forever is just because working with some of these vendors makes weeks feel like years. But in all seriousness, while there has been continuity at the surface with the big names, folks like AT&T, Verizon, BT, Microsoft, Looking a few inches deep shows that there have actually been many changes. For example, AT&T has spun off, acquired, spun off again, reconstituted many times in the last decade or so. The same is true for Verizon. And then there are names like Amazon and Cisco that seem rock solid, but so did others like Sprint, Level 3, Palm, remember them? And they're no longer independently standing entities. Another example that's kind of out there right now is VMware. It's in the process of being gobbled up by Broadcom. It just received approval from the European Commission, and I believe the UK's Competition Authority gave it a thumbs up, so it's still just waiting on US approval for that deal. And then, of course, you have carriers like Avaya, which have gone through not one, but two bankruptcies in the last decade. So the most recent rock-solid ICT company to be mentioned in the news for significant changes is British Telecom, BT. BT. Wow. You know, I know there have been rumors, but what are you hearing? Uh, Well, there are always rumors. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. But the most recent one is that BT is a potential takeover candidate and that it's working with Goldman Sachs and others. And depending on the source, either defending against or encouraging a takeover. BT CEO has announced he's retiring. They've announced a replacement. Deutsche Telecom owns about 12% of BT, and a French billionaire owns another 20 plus percent of BT, although he's publicly stated he's not interested in a takeover. And in fact, Bloomberg last year put BT at the top of the list for potential UK takeover targets. This is kind of amazing given that BT's origins date back to 1846. So I don't know what's going to happen, but what's important is that enterprises can't just sit back and assume that because it's a household name that there aren't going to be changes. They need to protect against what I call mad events. That's mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures. So interesting. And, you know, admittedly, most of my experience is on the customer side where we work to support their own merger acquisition and divestiture activity relative to their ICT provider agreements. Laura, what would you recommend enterprise do to protect against or prepare themselves for mad events where the actual provider of ICT services is the entity that is transforming? Well, I always like to say, don't get mad, get prepared. And there are several things that you can do from a contractual standpoint to help prepare and protect your company. First, you want to negotiate a strong assignment clause. Most ICT carriers, to be honest, are not going to agree to a provision that completely prohibits all assignments. But you can and you should put in protection so that any assignment is contingent on the party who's taking those assets, having the financial, technical, and operational resources to meet the obligations of the contract. They'll still be subject to the contract, but if it's a brand new company, you may be concerned that they don't have the depth of experience or the financial wherewithal to actually comply with those contractual terms. Certainly, you don't want them to have any less standing than your existing provider. The other thing that you can do is negotiate a strong merger clause. And a strong clause would require that if a provider merges with another provider that you use, so you're using, you know, provider A and provider B, you get to cherry pick the account team that remains on the account and the contract that will apply. That really can help you should those A and B merge together. 
But even if you don't have that clause, if you've heard of a potential member, this is a good time to determine who has the best support team and see if you can use some friendly competition to retain the best of the group and maybe get some valuable concessions along the way. As far as getting the more favorable contract, that's often a little bit more challenging to get in your contract and you're most likely going to end up in a negotiation. But you want to create leverage and you want to know what's in both of those accounts because they can be very different depending on the size and when they were entered into those contracts. And of course, timing is a critical factor in planning and also in leverage. If the time remaining on the acquired contract is 12 months or less, then it may not be worth the effort to renegotiate. You just want to plan for the end of that term. But if it's a longer period or both have significant revenue or volume commitments, you'll want to spend the time to negotiate the best deal you can, merging the best terms of both. Yeah, the account team can make a world of difference. And we know that providers can have very different contracts. You know, think about pricing T's and C's, particularly if one is substantially larger or was negotiated through an RFP process. So what else can an enterprise do, Laura? Tony, you're absolutely spot on in your comments. Another thing that customers can do, enterprises can do, involves the commitments. If you have a revenue or volume commitment and you're negotiating a deal, you should include the right to combine these if there's a merger or importantly, reduce those commitments to reflect any spinoff of services or any synergies or disconnects necessary. If there is a merger, you may have two different same lines into the same location but that's for redundancy or diversity. And you may lose that if it's the same carrier. So you want to be able to terminate as an example. And you want to be able to do that without liability and a reduction in whatever commitments you have. You also need to look at what happens and address what happens if the merger creates or divestiture creates issues for you, like regulatory problems. Is it somebody who's outside of the United States and is going to be processing data outside the United States? That can put a whole different spin on things. So those are some things to think about in advance and build into your contract. If you don't have them in your contract, as soon as you hear these rumors, you want to look at your contract. You need to start thinking about how you can walk around these issues. Yeah, for sure. And isn't service quality an issue? Absolutely, it can be. Sometimes it's the canary in the coal mine. Service can lag while the process is ongoing. And after the acquisition, as the parties try and get their ducks in a row, you'll have people leaving, changing, merging of technology. So it's always really good to have strong SLAs and remedies. However, if you're negotiating with a company that is contemplating a merger or a divestiture, add a clause that has heightened SLAs for the period of time prior to and following the merger or divestiture and get additional rights if the service starts to flag. Frankly, most standard SLAs only give meager credits for a remedy, and that's not going to do you much good if there's a big problem. Also, if they're contemplating a divestiture, make sure you have protections for any services they plan to divest. Likewise, if it's a proposed merger and the technologies don't mesh, you want to have the ability to either pick the better technology or time and the right to move off of it. So these are, frankly, great things to have in your contract anyway, but they're particularly important if there's a mad event in the foreseeable future. Finally, if you have a mad event and it's been announced after you've already inked your deal, which is probably the majority of the cases, and you don't have the strongest clause, don't panic because most of the time it takes at least a year from the agreement to divest or to merge and the actual event. And this gives you some time to plan. Those are really good suggestions, Laura. But what do you think about adding a clause that in the event of a divestiture would require the company to conduct a detailed audit of any services and related infrastructure that they provide to you today that are slated to be divested. I think this would be particularly helpful in quantifying any commitment reduction that might be warranted as a result of the divestiture activity. Oh, that's a good one. I like that one. I, I think that could be extraordinarily helpful on a number of fronts. You know, another thing you might want to consider is requiring high level executive briefings, you know, be for the bigger deals. If your ICT has announced a mad event or there's suggestions of a mad event or bankruptcy, but even if you don't have that in your contract, though, go ahead and ask for it because they want to keep their customers, particularly pre-deal, because it affects the valuation. So that's absolutely something on both ends to ask for. Also, we talked a little bit about SLA. Some other red flags to watch that give you a little bit of preview that there might be a mad event is for declining support, for layoffs, for account team departures or reshuffling, slow payment of credits or processing of disconnects, increased billing problems, uh, service declines we've talked about. 
also keep an eye out for regulatory proceedings because a lot of these ICT providers have to give a heads up to the various regulatory entities like the FCC if they're planning on something big. Slow payments for credits and an increased billing issues, she said. So any <laughs> any any parting thoughts today, Laura? Well, whatever you do, don't assume that an ICT company is too big to fail or that a mad event won't happen. If we've learned nothing else, we've learned that all companies are subject to mad events and it's much, much better to be prepared in advance to the extent possible. You know, and the other thing is similar issues apply to providers that decide to stop providing a key service, but we'll have to address that in another podcast. Great. Looking forward to it. Laura, thanks so much for sharing your perspective and experience on how to be prepared and what to do when your providers go through one of these mad events. As we all know, change is the only constant. You can reach out to Laura, me, or any of our TC2 and LB3 colleagues to discuss how to effectively manage your risk when facing one of these events. Finally, you can stay up to date with all the latest in the ICT space by subscribing to Staying Connected, by checking out our websites, and by following us on LinkedIn.